So our uh, next speaker I would like to introduce is Barry Trachtenberg. Uh, Dr. Dr. Trachtenberg is the program director of our Advanced Heart Failure Transplant Cardiology Fellowship. He's also the director of the Cardio Oncology Program and the associate director of our heart transplant program, uh, of our LVAD program. So he is going to be talking about heart transplant emergencies. Over to Barry. Thank you, Ahmad. All right, guys, we're in the home stretch. After this, we can stretch our legs, go to the bathroom, so hang with us. All right, so I'll be talking about transplant emergencies. So we want to discuss some of the common morbid morbidity mortality, really focusing on arrhythmias in transplant, infection, rejection, and cardiac allograft vasculopathy, and some of the early post-op complications that we see. So one, for starters, to, to put it into context, how is the transplant done? So there's two different techniques. One is the biatrial technique. You can see this um, drawing from Netter, where you have some of the, of the, of the donor atrium is attached to the recipient atrium, and then anastomosis is done from the, uh, with the atrium to the atrium. As opposed to the bicable technique, where you have the IVC and SVC anastomosis sites, so you're, you're not including any of the donor right atrium, of the recipient right atrium, excuse me. So uh, in the U.S., about two-thirds of, of the transplants are done with the bicable technique, and we think that number is increasing. The biatrial technique, the, the advantages are that it's a little, a little bit decreased ischemic time, and it's a little bit simpler technique. But it does have significant disadvantages, which is why we went away from that technique uh, several years ago, including mainly arrhythmias, um, SA no dysfunction, uh, bradycardia, the need for pacemakers, um, as well as tachyarrhythmias. Approximately 5% of patients that undergo the biatrial technique will need a pacemaker, um, depending on the threshold that your institution has, versus 2% um, or less in the bicaval technique. So how do we handle bradycardia? You know, early the post-operative period, a lot of these patients are on inotropes and pressors that, that, that might uh, have chronotropic effects. So, and all of our patients will come out with a temporary epicardial pacer wire at least in, for the first several days to a week or so after transplant. If, um, if they have symptomatic bradycardia despite weaning of, with weaning of inotropes, and um, we will um, consider pacemaker implantation if we put them on uh, beta agonists that are oral, such as terbutaline, um, and they still have a relative bradycardia, then we will uh, consider early pacemaker. And, um, of course, if it's beyond the several few days period, we will want to look for rejection as a cause of, of uh, the bradycardia. So for patients that have more delayed bradycardia, we do uh, one, make, want to make sure that their, their graft function is normal, and we want to see if they have any hemod hemodynamic dysfunction. If so, then we, then we will certainly want to look for rejection, or if it's several months to years later after transplant, want to rule out um, allograft vasculopathy, which is coronary disease in the, in the new transplant. Um, if those things are not present, then we want to rule out a drug effect. And if all those things have been done, then we would consider a pacemaker. So, so also, you have to understand that the heart is dener denervated. We, the vagus nerve is severed during the transplant. So you have a loss of your, of your efferent and afferent pathways. The sympathetic and, to a lesser extent, the parasympathetic uh, re innervation can occur to some degree, but that varies really from patient to patient. And, um, and so most patients will, because you're taking away the vagus nerve, will have a resting tachycardia, typically in the 90s to, a, to 110s, uh, which is why our threshold for a pacemaker in these patients is not going to be your 60-50 your like it is for your regular patients. It's going to be a little bit higher, um, typically at least in the 70s. Angina is, is uncommon due to denervation, so patients that have coronary disease may not present with the common typical angina you'll see in regular patients. And then patients are reliant on the circulating levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine. And so just taking that into context, when you look at typical medications that you may use in, uh, in urgent situations, so atropine, since it does rely on the vagus nerve, should not have an effect on patients that are transplanted um, for the most part, so it's really not effective. Um, adenosine also, um, it, because it, it, you do have receptors in the SA and AV you know that are hypersensitive, you may have an exaggerated effect. Uh, beta blockers, beta agonists may also have an exaggerated effect due to increased density of beta receptors and more reliance on circulating epinephrine, norepinephrine. And then finally, digoxin, as you know, also relies on the vagus nerve, so that will not be effective in, in patients uh, with transplant.
So focusing on early post-operative m and the things you really want to look out for is one is RV failure, and the, the predominant mechanism of RV failure early post-transplant is pre-existing pulmonary hypertension. This is why we really focus on looking at patients' hemodynamics while they're on the wait list and going into transplant, and we really fuss about their transpulmonary gradient, which we want to be ideally under 12, but certainly less than 15. That's their, their mean PA minus their wedge, uh, and also looking at their, their, their systolic PA pressure and their pulmonary vascular resistance, so their transpulmonary gradient divided by their cardiac output. And that's very important to, to have that you know, identified prior to transplant because that's a common cause of RV failure uh, post-transplant. So if that happens, uh, if, you, if you, you know, they have RV failure early on, you want to support them with inotropes, we have a low threshold for using inhaled nitric, nitric oxide. Of course, diuretics and, and uh, sometimes PDE5 inhibitors as well. Systemic vasodilation also can occur early after transplant. We always assume this is sepsis because patients are immunocompromised and, and they just received a heavy dose of steroids. And at some institutions, they're also given induction therapy, which, which we don't use at Methodist typically. And so you want to give them, an, you want to make sure they're on broad spectrum antibiotics and supporting them with whatever you can. But you also have to understand that cardiopulmonary bypass can cause a SIRS like reaction. So sometimes they're vasodilated due to just that cytokine response. And if those patients, you may want to consider methylene blue, which, which rarely works, but sometimes it does. And then hyperacute acute rejection, we'll talk about that. Primary graft failure, which is not immune related in treating with support, um, typically mechanical support will often, if someone has severe primary graft failure early after transplant, we'll often put them on ECMO to rest the heart and let the heart recover. Um, bleeding and of course bradycardia, which we discussed. So um, further, arrhythmias, atrial flutter is more common than AFib, particularly beyond the perioperative period. And that's really the most common arrhythmia associated with rejection. So if you see that, you want to have a low threshold to get an echo, get a biopsy, um, et cetera. Ventricular tachycardia, you might have non-sustained VT, especially in the early post-operative period. Um, and whether that's associated with early graft dysfunction or early graft failure has been variable um, in the literature. If you have symptomatic NSVT late after heart transplant, however, that can be associated with a severe allograft vasculopathy, so you want to take that seriously. And sustained uh, VT is uncommon, and you want to obviously take that seriously as well. So of the transplant recipients who die from cardiac causes, about 25% will die from sudden cardiac death. And most of these cases are related to rejection, acute ischemia, or severe graft dysfunction, or severe allograft dysfunction. And many of these patients don't have any anatomic abnormalities, and they just die from primary arrhythmia. So it's something to remember. The most common would be asystole versus, rather, and PEA, and less commonly VFib. One point I really want to hammer home today is, is about immunosuppression, and it's really a common you know, it's a balancing act between infection and rejection. So if I were to get a show of hands to see from you guys, see how many patients are patients more likely to die of infection or rejection, how many would you say rejection? Show of hands. Anyone? One hand, two hands? How about infection? Okay, I thought you guys were just being shy. Yeah, okay. Good job. Yeah, so more patients are more likely to die of infection. So you guys know all this stuff already. So if you look at the first 30 days, this is from uh, the ISHLT, a database. If you look at the most common causes of death in the first 30 days after graft failure, you have uh, multiple, multi, multi organ failure, and then you see in the light blue infection, which is really the highest cause overall in the first year of death um, at beyond the 30 day period. If you look at uh, rejection, which is going to be in that uh, light brown, um, I don't know what color you call that, it's the third from the bottom in the first 30 days and uh, it becomes less of a risk factor the longer you go out, but it still is always something you have to consider. So once you're beyond 10 years out, the most common cause of death is actually malignancy. Um, so that's uh, something to keep in mind. Rejection, this is a little bit, a lot of stuff on this slide, but to summarize, you know, it, it's, it's fairly common to have acute cellular rejection in your first year after transplant. The number of these episodes, the severity of these episodes does correlate with, with your allograft vasculopathy, coronary disease in the, in the recipient heart down the road and can affect outcomes down the road. And rejection really, it can be symptomatic, it can be asymptomatic, can have hemodynamic compromise, can be hemodynamically normal. Um, and so it really, this is why we do surveillance biopsies uh, early on when they're at high risk for rejection so we can 
find it on the cellular level before it becomes um, clinically significant. So if you have a high suspicion for rejection, really you need to do a biopsy. Um, and rejection can be hyperacute, acute, or chronic. Hyperacute, hopefully you'll never see. That's due to preformed antibodies, and that occurs within minutes of, of the transplant. And um, with our techniques to look for antibodies before transplant, it's very, very rare to see that uh, these days. This is the nomenclature for cellular rejection, zero and one, we're fine with. Two, um, two and three, we, we typically treat. Two, we might treat as an outpatient if they have normal hemodynamics, normal echo. Three, we always treat aggressively. Um, and for antibody mediated rejection, um, this is an older slide, so the, 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 they have updated the nomenclature, but you can have antibody mediated rejection also, um, and uh, there's histological grading scales, but we look at biopsy uh, findings and donor specific antibodies, which are a blood test, to look for antibody mediated rejection. And we're learning more and more about this, but we're still in the infancy of knowing about antibody mediated rejection and the optimal ways to treat it. Um, typically, if it occurs, we do. Um, you can try to remove antibodies with plasmapheresis, IVIG, and other um, newer agents. So once again, just remember that you know more patients will die of infection than rejection. Sepsis causes about 20% of all deaths in the first year. And remember, since these patients are immunocompromised, they may not mount to fever or leukocytosis. And if you look at the types of infections that patients may get, so the first. Uh, the first month, certainly, you have more common nosocomial infections. Beyond the one month, between one month and six months, you will see more of your atypical infections, nocardia, aspergillus, uh, certainly CMV. And then beyond the six-month period, just like an HIV patient that has a normal, normal count, you, you will expect them to have the most common infections will be the common infections as opposed to opportunistic infections. So um, briefly, shifting gears to, to CAV, this occurs in 8% of patients in the first year, so it's not common in the first year. But as you get beyond five years, it's much more common. And, uh, and about a third of patients will have some degree of, of coronary disease in their, in their new heart within five years. So early diagnosis is challenging, one, because patients typically don't have symptoms um, or a, they have atypical symptoms. They might present with a silent MI. They might present with heart failure or arrhythmias. And the risk factors for this, some of them are traditional, so that we think, uh, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, but also some of them are more transplant specific. So what the donor age was, what the donor uh, um, hypertension burden was, whether there's a high rejection burden, whether there's a high HLA mismatch on the front end, and the CMV burden are all thought to be risk factors for allograft vasculopathy. And if, if you look at the top picture, this is typical coronary disease that you'll see in non-transplanted patients that's typically focal, it, it's often uh, eccentric, um, as opposed to, to that. Transplant vasculopathy, as you can see in the bottom picture, is usually diffuse, it's proliferative, and typically concentric. Um, and it can be tricky. If it's in the distal vessel, it may just be a, a, a slight tapering of the distal vessel that can be pretty subtle. Some centers are using IVIS to diagnose that. Um, but the truth is, in terms of management of it, uh, we do sometimes stent severe lesions. We don't know that that has a survival benefit, but we also don't know that for patients that, that have stents that don't, outside of STEMIs. But uh, really, if you have a severe allograft vasculopathy, that's a bad sign, and some of these patients need retransplantation for that. And then just the, the final comment I'll leave you with is that these patients, um, if they present with acute rejection, uh, they can be uh, quite ill and with the EF that looks like the heart's barely moving. But if you can reverse that with, with uh, you know, it, sometimes we give antithymocyte glo anti globulin and, and heavy steroids, et cetera. If you can reverse that, sometimes the heart, uh, after several days of, of immunosuppression, will completely revert to normal. So these patients you really want to treat aggressively. So we often will use ECMO. We'll use um, Impella, Tandem, uh, sometimes balloon pumps to support these patients while we're uh, giving them immunosuppression, and they can do well with that uh, strategy. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys.